Hello everyone, this is Venus Brown of Diverse Spectrums. Today I'm coming to you with another topic from our neurodiversity segment. This one is on executive dysfunction. There was a time when I was young when I really didn't know anything about executive function. Really the closest that I had in the way of that knowledge was the understanding that there were some kids that had a lot of energy considered hyperactive, and some who had trouble paying attention. Both were being labeled ADD or ADHD when I was a kid. There was a great deal of controversy over how to deal with and discipline the children that were given these labels. A lot of adults insisting they just need to be disciplined with strict corporal punishment. Surely that would fix their problems. Please don't be one of those people that still thinks that fear and pain will solve these issues. While some still think this way, it is not helpful in dealing with someone on the spectrum or who has one or more resulting executive dysfunctions. Neurodiverse people already have fear and pain they experience just from the stigma that exists in the society that they have to live in every day of their life. It is support and autonomy that can help them become resilient in spite of that stigma. It wasn't until I had an auto accident where I found out that the resulting traumatic brain injury was actually causing me several executive functioning issues. I also call these administrative functioning challenges. It's the same kind of thing, executive function, administrative function, They're both referring to a set of skills that take place in the frontal lobe of your brain and a very important part of your higher order thinking skills. This post is going to dive deeper into those executive functions and dysfunctions and will go along with our dive into neurodiversity. Executive dysfunction is one of the many factors that can influence the lives of some of our neurodivergent community. Since my own introduction into executive function, I have learned so much just from my own experiences, from my kids who both have challenges in these areas, college education program, from working with students with various strengths and challenges both neurotypical and neurodivergent. I think all of us would benefit from some basic understanding about executive function and executive dysfunctions, and more understanding of those who have one or more executive dysfunctions. Let's start by addressing what exactly executive function is. An article in Therapist tells us the area in the front of our brain called the frontal lobe is something referred to as the control center where several higher order thinking processes occur. Processes like using and storing information, adapting to changing environments, self-regulation, and attention all involve executive functions. We can break those down into three main areas, working memory, mental flexibility, and self-control. An article in Cleveland Clinic uses similar yet more medical terminology in their description. Working memory, they tell us, involves the active processing of information you are using right now, in the moment. You are working with those immediate memories, facts, and information. Mental or cognitive flexibility involves your brain's ability to adapt and flex with changing environments, plans, topics, and ideas. Self-control or inhibition control involves your ability to self-regulate, manage how you think, feel, and act in various situations. This helps us to move through various situations, discussions, and events in ways that may be considered by society as appropriate to those situations. According to Janice Rodden, these are skills that can help us to be socially effective and succeed in life. Some of the other executive functions involve organizing, estimating, planning, finding and sustaining attention, judging, and keeping track of time, problem solving and using reason or critical thinking skills. Interestingly, while executive functions are conducted in the frontal lobe of the brain, an article in the National Library of Medicine tells us they can actually be affected by injuries to other areas of the brain. His executive functions are sensitive to several neurologic, mental health, and medical conditions, there are actually many reasons that executive dysfunctions can occur, and many conditions that can involve executive dysfunction. Let's say we have trouble keeping track of information in the moment. We might be absent-minded forgetting about things that just happened, forgetting what we were supposed to be doing, or maybe not remembering those things quite right. These kinds of things present challenges with our working memory. Imagine how difficult it might be to focus, to really, really focus, if you sometimes forget things very quickly or you don't remember them right. It doesn't even have to be often, but repeated, ongoing, or more often than typical. Because yes, 
everyone forgets sometimes. Everyone is forgetful sometimes, but this is beyond what is considered normal or typical. All right, everybody, I realized that I had not had my earbuds on. So I have plugged my earbuds in and hopefully that won't be a problem. Let's say we have trouble responding appropriately to certain situations. We have trouble weeding out irrelevant or unimportant information. We might be impulsive, just say whatever we're thinking or do whatever we're feeling. Notice every little thing, act on every little thing, just have trouble regulating ourselves. These are challenges with inhibitions. It can cause problems socially, emotionally, and with getting things done. It can be troublesome to those who observe or feel conflict from someone with these challenges, but they can also be troublesome to the person with those challenges themselves. Say you struggle with changing situations, shifting your attention when needed, going between multiple tasks, changing environments, and actions. These are challenges with mental flexibility that can make regular transitions that occur in life and day-to-day -day activities very frustrating and troublesome to those who experience. An article in Headway also addresses challenges like starting tasks, staying on task, making plans, sticking to plans, keeping track of appointments and other time-based challenges, finding solutions, keeping things orderly and free of chaos, anticipating consequences, thinking ahead, step-taking, and moving forward. All of these challenges can be part of executive dysfunction. They can occur in various ways with various frequency and various intensity, making each person's experience with executive dysfunction different. No two people with executive dysfunction are completely alike. It's like no two people with autism are completely alike, but they can experience challenges from similar areas. Various diverse challenges can show up in school, in work, in your day-to-day -day life, but they can also be positively or adversely affected by certain other issues. One of the things that's actually been shown to be helpful with executive dysfunction issues is aerobics. Now, I don't know if that applies to other exercise routines and activities. I assume it probably does, but I'd have to look further into it. A Promises article states that aerobics can help with things like paying attention, changing tasks, holding multiple things in your mind at once. They also tell us that prioritizing the most important tasks can help us when there are many things clamoring for our attention at once, plus reducing tasks into smaller parts and placing least important tasks for last. Proving your positive emotions and outlook to reduce stress can assist in building resilience and flexibility while opening us to more problem-solving options. According to Jill James, MD of GoodRx, practicing to build routines and habits makes it easier to accomplish these tasks. Plus regular exercise, that's any kind of physical activity that gets your heart rate up and gets you moving. They can boost your mood, reduce your stress. They even help by practicing on focusing and using your working memory. According to another article in the National Library of Medicine, severe depression and anxiety can further impair your executive function. We do note that this may not hold up with less severe periods of depression. This further impairment of executive functions could possibly be because of the effects of depression and anxiety on your frontal lobe. In fact, any increased impact, illness, or injury to the frontal lobe can impair executive function further. That can also heal with time and assistance. In this article's specific study, they found that memory, inhibition control, planning, flexibility, decision-making, and sustained attention were more impacted with cases of depression, anxiety, and high stress. And with their comparison group of healthy individuals that did not have anxiety, depression, or high stress. In this last section, we'll go over techniques and tactics that can help improve certain areas of executive dysfunction. This can help us to keep a set of tools on hand when we need it, like a toolbox or backpack of important resources. It's important to find tools and resources that work well for you, that are individualized for your own diverse situations, your personality, your behavior, you will likely experience in your own life. Just remember that what works well for some may work well for you, but it may not work well for you at all. At the same time, what works great for you may or may not work great for somebody else. I think the best way to deal with that is to try certain tools that are geared towards your challenges. Keep practicing them for a while, maybe for a few weeks, maybe for a certain amount of tries. See if they work. Figure out which tools seem to work the best in different situations. Then try out more for a while. Continue to find resources that help 
while weeding out those things that don't work or make problems worse. This can be a long ongoing process that you keep working on and adjusting as you find more tools and resources as your life changes and settles. Still, finding tools and resources that work well for you, your life, with your family situation, with your school, work, friend, or day-to-day -day life situation can be very helpful in improving and working with your executive dysfunction and your executive skills. Now, this list of tips, tools, and resources comes from three separate articles by Carter Hammett, Anessa Kemna, and Jackie Hebert. I did try to organize them so they are not completely long, disorganized, and jumbled up. The first category is to limit distractions. You can remove distractions by turning them off, scheduling them for certain times, reducing them, or physically moving them. Find or create quiet workspaces. You can use things like earplugs, noise canceling headphones, white noise, sound muffling, quiet music, etc. You can create separation using dividers, empty rooms, walls, insulation, etc., and hopefully decrease noise and visual disturbances. You can set do not disturb periods for notices, alarms, emails, calls, etc., and have them set to be shut off or silenced within a certain period. I labeled this category helpful ideas. You can create environments that work well for your strengths, challenges, tasks, your field of work, behavior, your clients, your associates, leaders, co-workers, etc. Create a folder with helpful resources, tips, and techniques for your specific needs and challenges. Use apps that read to you or write the words that you're saying with text-to-speech and speech-to-text. Apps, programs, and browsers that allow highlighting, comments, note-taking, and bookmarks. Use a three-ring binder to organize books, papers, devices, using pocket dividers, report covers, add a zippered pouch for supplies like pins, paper clips, pencils, thumb drives, earbuds, earplugs, erasers, whiteout, and any other small things that you need to keep track of and have on the go. You can also keep added ideas like jackets, blankets, pillows, and other items of comfort in your work area. This next category is health, wellness, and support. I also broke down two areas into subcategories. Prioritize sleep, diet and wellness within your daily and weekly schedule. Use apps to track your health needs like sleep, cycles, and habits. Practice mindfulness and being present in the moment. This is one of the areas that I broke down into a subcategory. Things to keep in mind when practicing mindfulness. Consider the situation. Consider each person involved. Pay attention to things like words, facial expression, body language, tone, and intent they may be expressing. And keep in mind, these things do not come natural to everyone. Some of these things may have to be learned or taught and may need a lot of practice. Be thoughtful, conscientious, and attentive to the people involved, to their needs, their experiences, their perspectives, concerns, feelings, suggestions, and ideas, but also be thoughtful and attentive to your own concerns, feelings, and needs. Consider the consequences of both yours and others' words, actions, behaviors, and plans or decisions. The other subcategory I broke down is for seeking support, therapy, counseling, coaching, advising, or consulting when necessary, suggested, or advisable. One-on-one -on -one therapy and counseling can provide direct outside support. Coaching, consulting, and advising can help with guidance and motivation. Friends and family who provide unconditional care in relationships are very important to support. Coworkers that listen and are willing to hang out can be helpful as well. Even community acquaintances can sometimes provide some sorts of support. Support groups can be very helpful with certain specified challenges and traumas. Even online support groups can be very important to certain niche issues, as well as for those who prefer to be alone or socially isolated or even geographically isolated. The next category is for increased productivity. It will have a lot of overlap with the category time management. 
Let's say you have trouble getting started. Use a simple task that you can complete in about five minutes and just do it. Use a timer to complete a quick task or even a longer task if you have the endurance and attention to do it or use the timer to see how far you can get in a set amount of time. Track your time, finding out how long you can sustain attention on certain tasks. This can help you to decide how long you need to work on things, when to take breaks, make judgments in creating timelines, etc. Take frequent short breaks between tasks and occasional long breaks to unwind, step back, reflect, relax, replenish, etc. Save your less important tasks for times that you tend not to do your best work. Break down larger tasks into smaller, easier, more manageable size. Practice to build habits, routine, and consistency. If something you need to get used to, something you need to learn or improve, something you need to remember to do, schedule it and keep practicing. Use habit building apps to help build routines and habits. Use highlighting, color coding, and bolding for important items and information. Write notes and lists for groceries, meals, contacts, and other things. Place those notes and lists where they're easily seen and paid attention to. Okay, this next category is time management. Like I said, it will probably overlap significantly with the previous. Pre-plan a task or action for after a break. You can write it down, schedule it, and think it through. Plan and schedule intentional breaks. By doing this, you're actually guiding your breaks to focus on specific things. You make your own choice on what those things will consist of, focusing on specifics like breathing, resting, heating up or cooling off, thinking or pondering, dreaming, imagining, snacking, meditating, walking, walking with a pet, feeding a pet, watering a plant, reading, enjoying music, eating a meal, having a coffee or other drink, stretching, talking to a parent, friend, or coworker, writing a poem, letter, or text, bouncing on a ball, bouncing a ball, playing, watching a quick show or skit, doing your hair, makeup, nails, giving or getting a massage or whatever you want to do. You can try the Pomodoro technique, which is similar to the short breaks and then a long break. What you do is you break down your work to tasks that you work on for about five to 30 minutes, depending on how long is appropriate for you. Then take a short break. You cycle back through that. Do that a few times, then you'll take a long break. You go back and you go through those same cycles again. And of course you adjust it to your specific needs. Determine and categorize your priorities and then schedule them accordingly. Plan important tasks for time periods that you do your best work. Schedule tasks for times of day that you work best on those tasks. Set times for sorting things. Allow some time after a set of small tasks or after one large task to work on distractions it's like email, social media, taking calls, sending messages, and making purchases. Just make sure that you go back to work after that set amount of time. Overestimate the amount of time you think it will take to complete certain tasks, challenges, appointments, meetings, assignments, projects, goals, and objectives. Use calendar apps for scheduling important meetings, appointments, events, and deadlines. Use time management and scheduling apps. They can be gamified or use other methods of engagement or disengagement, including alarms or alerts, themes, color schemes, or other attention grabbers. And this last category is for developing a sorting system for placing, organizing, removing, or setting aside important and less important things. Plan a whole system or arrangement and use each part. Think in mind what works for you, for your situation, and adjusting what hasn't been working. Color code for levels of importance, ease of use, certain types of tasks, information, etc. But you don't have to use color coding. If you prefer, you can use other methods of coding such as symbols, sounds, words, textures, and images to categorize things as well. Choose your locations and ways of sorting, like inboxes, files, file cabinets, bins, computer filing, devices, notices, and reminders. Make a list of rules for sorting, what to keep, what to toss, where to place things, when and how to access, keeping track of numbers, access codes, PIN numbers, usernames, passwords, and keeping important information seen and accessed. Finding a home for anything that doesn't have a home. 
Come up with a plan for new and old things that don't fit. Choose how to implement or discard them. Make decisions on keeping or removing things. How useful is it? Does it get used? Does it bring you joy or sadness? Does it cause frustration or ease frustration? Is it distracting or time consuming? Is it efficient or inefficient? Is it necessary or unnecessary? Can it be improved? Create cheat sheets, templates, graphs, charts, tables, as well as codes and keys to confusing words and acronyms, especially for those things that you find challenging to remember or complete in a timely and effective manner. Keep checklists, notes, contact information, and templates nearby and accessible. Use post-its, sticky tabs, and labels for organizing and quickly finding information. And then my suggestion to you is to add anything that you want to or need to to any of those categories. Use what you need and toss out what you don't. Because like I said, these resources are going to be for what works for you, what works in your situation, and your life will change. So sometimes those tools and resources that you need and use will change. That's all I got for you this week. I hope to see you next week. And remember, if you like this content, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe, click all. You'll get notifications every time more content comes out. See you when I see you. Bye.